Good morning. So for those of you that don't know me, I am Claire Mulrooney and I get to be part of our wonderful church here at Verso St Albans. And, um, and you have the joy of hearing my voice this morning. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't been around, we've been in this series on hope. And Mark has been doing a phenomenal job, hasn't he, of laying the foundation for us on what biblical hope is and how we walk in it and why we should have hope and all that good stuff. So I encourage you, if you're online this morning or if you're in the room for the first time, to go back and have a little listen to his talks um, because I promise you they will bless you and they will help just unravel this whole topic in a better way. So I have the privilege of being a mum to four teenagers. And I say privilege because it is, it's a privilege. Um, But my youngest son, Trey, who actually is technically not a teenager, he's six months off, but he likes to think he is. Um, He has always had this entrepreneurial kind of spirit. He's always been my kid who will find the best deal, the way to find a good giveaway. He's always coming to me, mum, have you seen this? If we did this, if we entered this, we could get this much money. Um, And he's always kind of, yeah, he's just always had that about him. He's always had this incredible optimistic view on life. Um, And about a year ago, he nudged past the screen that he plays his Xbox on and the screen fell and it cracked. And as you might imagine, in a teenage boy's world, that was devastating. It was even more devastating when he learned that his mum and dad were not going to buy him a new one without him having to work a little bit to earn some money to replace this screen. And he walks into the kitchen one day and he's like, mum, I found this thing. If I do this for this company, they're going to send me a brand new monitor. And I was like, dude, how many times have we had this conversation? They're not going to send the monitor. They just say that. They just want you to do the hard work for them, and they're not going to give you a monitor. I've lived a lot of life. I know how this works. Lo and behold, he did it anyway. (laughs) And a week later, this three, four hundred pound monitor arrived on our doorstep. And he was like, I told you so, mum, I told you. (laughs) Nothing more delightful in a teenager's world than to tell their parent that they knew better than them. (laughs) But it got me thinking because, you know what? I think that we approach God's provision a little bit like how I approach that situation. I think out of wanting to protect Trey's heart, I was going to give him this guarded expectation of the promise. And I think that I approach God like that, despite him being the God that says in Philippians 4.19 that I will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I treat him a bit like a finicky company and I've built a guarded expectation around those promises. And that's what I want us to dig into. That's what I felt like the Lord put on my heart for us to dig into here this morning. So we're going to look at who walks in confident expectation, because that's what hope is, confident expectation in the promises of God's provision this morning. So I want you to turn with me to Genesis 22. And we're going to look at the story. And if you are brand new to the Bible, I just want to give you a pre-warning. This passage can seem a bit odd. But if you're brand new to the Bible, come and talk to me afterwards. Um, It's never a good idea to take a passage without reading the whole thing. (laughs) Um, And there's some great stuff online to help us unravel that. But bear with me as we stick into Genesis 22. And it says this, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, And he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son, Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship, and we will come back to you again. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on his son Isaac, and he took his hand, and in his hand he took the fire and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here am I, my son. 
He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and, in order, and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and he took the knife to sacrifice his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. And as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So what is going on here in this story? It's a bit odd, isn't it? Um, But essentially, God is asking Abraham to walk a road that makes no sense. God is asking him to take his son, Isaac, who was given to him as provision in response to a promise that God had made on Abraham to make him the father of many nations, which meant he needed Isaac, that son, that heir, to carry out the promise. And after a, in this moment here, he's saying, take the thing I've given you and give it back to me. It seems crazy because if he gives it back to him and he kills his son, surely this whole promise can't be fulfilled. And what's more crazy is that Abraham actually does it. He walks up this road on Mount Moriah, but we see in Abraham a man who has confident hope in God's provision. And we see it in verse five and verse eight. Verse five, it says, stay here with the donkey. He's talking to his servants. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come back to you again. And we notice that he says, it's not I will come back to you. He says, we will come back to you. He's got this confident expectation that God is going to provide. And verse eight, it's the same. Isaac, they're further into this journey. And logically, Isaac starts to say, well, hold on a minute. What what is going on here? Like the questions are rising. And he's saying, dad, like... We don't have anything for the sacrifice. And Abraham again speaks out this confident hope. Don't worry, Isaac, God's got this. He's going to provide. It's intriguing. And it got me thinking, what has led to this moment? And you have to kind of understand a little bit of Abraham's life. If you look back to chapter 12, where he enters the Bible, we see that God commissioned him, right, to leave his home country And he gives him this promise to make him a great nation and to be a blessing to the nations around him. But what we notice in Abraham's story, if you take time to read it, is that this is a man who navigates relationships. Spousal relationships, relationships in community, relationships in politics, relationships in leadership. He navigates the tension of wealth. He navigates the tension of of waiting of being given a promise and not seeing it to be fulfilled immediately. He navigates what it looks like when he thinks God's being too slow and taking the promise into his own hands and trying to make it happen. And he watched God's faithfulness stick with him and patiently walk with him. And we watch as this promise of a son is fulfilled and he's given Isaac his firstborn son. And so as he walks into chapter 22, God calls his name. And what do we see? Abraham responds, here am I. He knows the sound of God's voice. And as we look at the reality of what it means to walk in the promise of God's provision, we need to take note. There's something about being familiar with who God is. There's something about walking with God, growing in relationship, something about being fueled by testimony. Abraham had so many testimonies of God being with him that no doubt when he was walking up that mountain, they were running in his head, right? There's power in our testimony. We know this. There's something about speaking out the truth. Abraham speaks it out. And what happens is he speaks it out. Even with Isaac, he, the truth becomes the ground that Isaac walks on, right? 
He brings the truth before the feelings of the moment, and the truth transforms the ground on which he's walking. But I also want us to notice that in the 11th hour, Abraham is not walking in defeat, okay? He is at the 11th hour staying obedient to what God has said to him, and he is interruptible. He knows the sound of God's voice, and he knows what God shows up like, and he's interruptible, and he allows God to shift his perspective and show him the provision for the moment. This is challenging, (laughs) right? But actually, as we see this picture building, I don't think it comes as a surprise. If we've been in church a while, we know power of testimony. We know this good stuff, right? We, We know this. It's not much of a surprise. You know my question for this story? (laughs) The thing that I've been grappling with as I've looked at this? How does Abraham actually put one foot in front of the other and keep walking up that mountain? Like, what is going on inside of him that enables him to put one step in front of the other knowing that if God doesn't come through, in this moment, in the way that he would like him to come through, he's going to experience one of the most painful and heartbreaking impossibilities of surrendering the most precious thing in his hands. What is going on inside of him that he can walk in these seeming contradictory realities of a promise, but the road before him looks like nothing, anything's going to happen but the promise? Because it's this in-between part of the journey that for me is the most relatable. Because I've known what it's like for God to give me something and say, Clara, I want you to give it back to me and I don't know how it's going to work out. I know what it's like to be thrown into circumstances where I'm not sure how the story's going to end or into circumstances where the story doesn't end the way that I want it to end. And somehow, God tells us that we can walk in confident hope of his provision anyways. And I think to understand this fully, we've got to start with what is it that God promises us? So let's do a quick scan through. (laughs) God promises, as we read at the beginning in Philippians, to provide all of our needs, not some of them, all of them. He provides for our physical needs. Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Therefore do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. He knows all of your needs and he promises to provide for them. He knows our spiritual needs. 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has given everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Not some of the things that we need, everything that we need. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, At at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in all that you set your hand to. All things, are we hearing it? What an amazing promise. Not some, all. Promises to provide for our emotional needs. Paul writes in Philippians 4, 12 to 13, I know how it is to be brought low and I know how it is to abound in an any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. How? Because I can do all things through him who strengthens me. God promises to strengthen us in all things. He promises us rest. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If we take on Jesus' way of doing things, we find rest. Not if God feels like it. He's not a finicky company. He's true to his word. 
And the promises in the Bible, literally, it is like rammed. I could have just sat here and read promises to you all morning and it would have been wonderful because they're true. This is true, right? There's no way around it. It's true. But let's be real. When we walk out of here and we get that phone call to tell us that we lost our job, and despite months later not having a job, we naturally start to question, like, where is your provision, God? You said all of my needs. My bank balance needs you. It needs money. We endure long health journeys where we're like, if, if I could just be well, I could do this for you, God. And we don't see his provision in the way that we want to see his provision. We watch as a church is persecuted around the world and there's injustice and we wonder, where are you, God? We grieve as we walk through dreams dashed and weighed in disappointment and we wonder if God actually does see my needs. Maybe you've turned up on that playground for the 15th million time to try to tell a teacher why your child needs this provision at school and it's not coming. Or you've worked faithfully, being promised for a promotion at work, and yet it just never seems to come through. But if you could have it, God, I'd be generous. I would pour into the care centre. I would do this. I'd do this for you. If you just could see this need. Sometimes it's even more granular. I know there are people in this room who this week will have gone around a supermarket and decided they need to take food out of their trolley because there's not enough in the bank balance to put everything in it that you want. It can feel like we're living in the reality of two polar worlds. And these words sound wonderful until the rubber hits the road in my life, in the path I have to walk, where sometimes, if I'm honest, it feels like God's promises are teasing me. And I'm wondering if he's actually blind to what is needed in this moment. And it's this mystery, guys, it's this point that we become prey that guarded expectation to become the director of our understanding of who God is. And we package it as wisdom. And I want to ask myself, and I want to invite you to ask yourself, where this morning is your guard up on your understanding of God's provision? Because guarded expectation looks a lot like us trying to work out how we're going to solve this on our own, how we're going to meet our needs. And it sneaks in the form of independency and it looks like God's not working fast enough, so I need to solve it. And we start to shift ourselves back into that lordship position of our lives where we say, actually, I know better than God. I know exactly what I need. And if he can't see it, then I guess I have to take it into my own hands. And I think that some of us in this room this morning need to dare to believe that God is who he says he is again. Dare to believe like Abraham that God really is who he says he is, even when our circumstances want to cause us to question it. And we need to see in Abraham that he was doing something each step of that journey with what he saw, what he felt, what he th was thinking, what he was longing for, what he was holding precious. What was he doing internally? He was surrendering. And I believe it's the only way forward to fully experience what it's like to live in the confident expectation of God's provision one step at a time is found in surrender. And here is why. Because this passage in Genesis 22 at the start of the scriptures is a foretelling of what God himself works out when we get into the New Testament where we see that God did not ask Abraham to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself, right? Just as Abraham walked in willing obedience to give his only son, the son whom he loved and treasured, 
the precious thing that God had provided. God looked on our world and he saw what was needed right now here in 2024 and he was willing to give his one and only much loved treasured son. And just as Abraham called that mount that he walked on, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provided. And we see the fulfillment of that second part of the verse, on the mount of the Lord it shall be seen and provided. When Jesus walked up the hill of Calvary, and as that much loved precious son carrying the wood of cross on his back that he then laid on, to become the ultimate sacrifice of provision that is readily available for us in this moment. And get this, Jesus endured the moment when God turned his face and the darkness covered the earth. Why? So that you and I never have to endure God turning his face on us. We never have to experience what it's like to have God turn his face on us through any path that we have to walk. Jesus eradicated the separateness and made us joint heirs so that we could have access to the fullness of the person of God, our inheritance like Jesus right now, right here. And as Abraham calls that place on Mount Moriah, Jehovah Jireh, I want us to see what he was doing. When he cried Jehovah, what he was saying is, Lord, What is he also saying if he's calling him Lord? I am not Lord. And when he calls out Jireh, he's saying it's the Lord who sees and provided. And so what he's also saying is that I am not the Lord and I don't fully see and I don't fully know what is needed, but I surrender to you. Jehovah Jireh is a declaration of surrender. It's a declaration of our surrender. And so I want us to see that hope in God's provision isn't something we conjure up. It's not something that we have to stiffen up our backs and be like, let's go. Yes, God's going to provide. Because it's not based on you and me and how good we are. It is based on the goodness and the kindness and the love of a father in heaven who sees you and he loves to pour out his good gifts upon you. And God's provision was made a reality for Abraham when he surrendered over and over and over again, giving God access to the most precious part of who he was, to the truth and the person of God provider. Hope came alive when God sent Jesus into the world, but it was made a reality when Jesus surrendered to the will of his father. And he cried in that garden of Gethsemane, Abba, Father, Everything is possible for you. But would you take this cup from me? Don't make me walk in this moment. But he says, but not my will, but what you will, and I will go. And he walks that road of obedience, trusting his father, saw what was needed and provided. Provision made a reality. Our confident expectation comes alive in you and me every time we choose to bring our whole lives in surrender to God, each step, the good, the hard, the ordinary, giving God back our questions, giving him back our lack of understanding. And when we do, our lives become the place that we can call Jehovah Jireh. And we then get the opportunity to be a demonstration of who God is to every person that we encounter around us. And I've come to understand this, not honestly just by reading the Bible or by amazing testimonies of his provision. I could have stood here and I could tell you some miraculous, crazy stories of provision Right, because we've seen them, we've spent years in, on the mission field and we have seen God do crazy stuff. But most of the stories of my life have been like the story on Mount Moriah of having to learn the beauty of surrender that has led to a confident hope in the provision of God in the nitty gritty of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 
And those testimonies help. They fueled my faith for these moments. The word has fueled my faith, but the end of the day, the place where the confident hope has come alive in me has been when I've said, God, have it all. And I've learned that surrender is not holy chit-chat. Let's be, let's be clear, okay? It's not this like nice, oh, I pray this and I get this. Surrender is a wrestle, right? Sometimes it's ugly. It's not like ugly crying in my car, yelling at God, like, what are you thinking? What is going on? Even as our family in the last eight months, we got that phone call eight months ago to say that because of the financial crisis, my husband was being made redundant. We were like, what is happening? We are in the most expensive season of family life. God, where are you? We're eight months into this journey and guess what? The provision of a job, which to me is like the most obvious form of provision, (laughs) is not made a reality yet. And in this season, I have learned about the beauty and the power and the truthfulness of surrender. And God has been reminding me in the days that it's hard, in the days when I read his promises and they just don't, they feel a little bit like he's teasing me. He reminded me of Psalm 23 where he says, you know what, Claire? If I'm your shepherd, you lack for nothing. And that even in the valley of the shadow of death and in the presence of our enemies, I prepare a table for you to feast on even now. But what do I have to do to feast at that table? I have to receive his invitation to come and take a seat at the table. And I can't sit at his table if I'm too distracted by where I'm going to get to, or if I'm trying to wrestle to get through this valley, or if I'm trying to figure out how it's going to work out. He's saying, no, Clara, will you come take a seat? So I've got what you need for this moment. I'm not going to force it on you. I'm not going to throw it in your face. But I'd love to hear how you're feeling today, and I'd love to meet you there and provide for you. And the beauty of his provision as a reality has not looked like that job coming through, but it has looked like me learning to surrender my pride and my independence to say thank you to the radical generosity of friends who've walked in this road with us. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. God's provision is beautiful. It's looked like surrendering the tiredness. Why? Because God wants to give grace. He wants us to give us the bread of grace so that we'd give grace to ourselves. It's like a million things, but it's been in the car. It's been at that playground. It's been in the nitty gritty of Monday to Friday. And this is what I have learned. And this is where we're going to end. Hope in God's provision does not need to be guarded because hope in his provision never puts us to shame. Why? Because God never puts you to shame and your expectation can be confident in his provision because we are confident in the goodness and the kindness and the love of a God who sees your every need and he promises as you give him access to show you his provision for this moment. He will never put you to shame. So stand with me.